Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar called Leverage Product Intelligence to Improve Category Performance This Holiday Season. I'm Debbie House, Editor-in-Chief of Retail Touchpoints, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. We're honored to be joined today by Sutarita Polru from Forrester and Sudhir Ola from UGAM, who will share insights into how to determine the steps to take to improve product performance in the midst of a prime-time holiday selling. This webinar event is the fourth in a series of nine presented as part of the Retail Touchpoint Strategy and Planning Series. During this series, attendees have had the opportunity to hear from leading industry experts who are discussing the most important topics on retailers' minds today as they finalize holiday strategies and plan for 2016 success. By registering for one session, attendees have the access to all complimentary presentations live and on demand. So if you're not able to attend one or more of the sessions, they're all available free to all registrants. You can access them on demand at your convenience, and to learn more, you can go to the Retail Touchpoints website. We also welcome you to follow this and all other strategy and planning series webinars on Twitter, Twitter using the RSPS15 hashtag. So for today's presentation, we're using the ON24 platform. So right now you should be viewing the ON24 dashboard, which shows the live viewing screen. By clicking on the questions widget on the right-hand side of the screen, you can type in questions during the live presentation and press Submit. You'll also find a widget named Resources under Questions. Here you can download assets our presenters have provided. All you have to do is click on the resource and it will automatically download. And also be sure to participate in the conversation on Twitter. Using the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the ongoing conversation with the RSPS15 hashtag. Additionally, we'll be conducting some interactive poll questions with our attendees today. So when it's time to participate, you'll see the poll question appear in the slide view, and then you just click on your selected answer. So for those of you who might be new to Retail Touchpoints, here's a very quick overview. We're an all-digital media company publishing a weekly email and online newsletter, daily news, special reports, and multimedia presentations. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter. We welcome input and feedback through traditional means, phone and email, and also social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Our website is www.retailtouchpoints.com. So before I introduce today's speakers, I want to remind the audience that the presentation is slated for approximately 30 to 40 minutes with time for live questions at the end. Again, we invite you to submit questions in the ON24 questions area as they come to mind. And the webinar is being recorded, and all attendees will receive an archive link to the presentation to go back and review or share with colleagues. And the pre presentations also will be available via SlideShare. So our first presenter today is Sucharita Mulpuru, Vice President, Principal Analyst, servicing e-business and channel strategy professionals at Forrester Research. She's a leading expert on e-commerce, multi-channel retail, consumer behavior, and trends in the online shopping space. She's a noted authority on technology developments that affect the online commerce industry and vendors that facilitate online marketing and merchandising. In her research, Sucharita covers such consumer-oriented topics as e-commerce forecasting and trends, merchandising best practices, conversion optimization, and social computing in the retail world. She's also authored The State of Retailing Online, which is an annual industry study. And then we'll hear from Sudhir Ola, Senior Vice President of Retail at UGAM. Sudhir is focused on leading UGAM's drive toward actionable insight solutions for the retail industry. He has a wealth of retail industry knowledge with more than 18 years of consulting experience, helping retailers improve their digital commerce and supply chain performance. Sudhir previously worked at Accenture and Infosys, where he established and led the multi-channel commerce practice. He's worked extensively in the area of price intelligence and implementing solutions for retailers. An engineer MBA, Sudhir believes in the power of democratic data to drive retailer decisions on pricing, assortment, and content. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Sucharita. Welcome to you, Sucharita. Thanks, Debbie. Appreciate the introduction. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you guys a bit of uh, how we see not just pricing, but also just uh, some of the opportunities related to site merchandising um, and uh, and how really product types are going to change in the future. Um, so to start with, I think it's important to recognize the landscape of competition in the retail ecosystem. And uh, the first thing that's incredibly important to keep in mind is that there is competition not just in the Internet, um, and that is something that we all are very 
familiar with, particularly as online growth rates are as large as they are, um, but also in the offline world as well. And so what we have here are um, a few data points. The first set on the top are the number of stores, um, and that in that, that we have web stores on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, essentially all the bricks and mortar stores on the left hand side and it's the growth rate between two the years 2002 and 2014 and uh, you're probably at some level familiar with the data on the right hand side which is that e-commerce stores um, have exploded and there are now almost um, 750,000 new e-commerce merchants but there are also um, I thought was interesting is nearly a million new physical doors um, that are that have opened in the United States now what that means is that the growth in stores has been significantly greater than, of course, the growth in overall retail. So the average revenue per store is substantially lower now than it was in 2002. And that's also something that is important to keep in mind when we hear about declining foot traffic is that um, a lot of that is, isn't necessarily due to the Internet. It's just due to the amount of competition that we have in the entire retail ecosystem. And uh, because of that competition, and it is incredibly difficult to really nudge your key performance indicators. And um, every year with shop.org, um, I put together a retail survey where we survey merchants and ask them their specific um, metrics for their e-commerce websites. And uh, these are basically in the middle columns, the average benchmarks that we see for the various metrics that typically an e-commerce company is going to hold itself accountable to. So we know, for instance, that the average retailer sees a site conversion rate of about 2.5%. And interestingly, that figure hasn't budged in nearly a decade. And I have uh, done this survey for, for about a decade. In fact, Forrester did it even before I joined Forrester. Um, and these numbers have, uh, have, have barely changed. We're looking at site abandonment rates that are similar repeat customer um, rates, return rates, um, all generally holding pretty steady. Um, and at the same time, these are incredibly important metrics that can help support sales. So really what is the biggest driver of consumers actually buying on the Internet isn't necessarily that the improvement in these metrics is as much of a factor as it is that um, more consumers are comfortable purchasing online and you're essentially getting more traffic to websites. Um, so we also see there are a handful of other performance metrics here, particularly toward the bottom of the slide where we're talking about things like customer service costs or fulfillment costs per order, um, marketing costs, new customer acquisition costs, which are actually the marketing costs are getting higher um, because of the competition with the limited um, media formats that we have um, in, again, the 10 years that we've done this survey, um, uh, tactics like search and email continue to uh, be dominant. And while email um, actually is one tactic where the prices are going down, um, that it has always never really been a significant part of the overall marketing mix. It's been more tactics like paid search and that's, that's not something that is necessarily becoming any cheaper. And then when you look at, um, at things like fulfillment costs per order, those two are challenged by um, free shipping offers and uh, the aggressiveness with which the competitive landscape is uh, not just offering free shipping, but shipping things to customers in a very um, fast fashion. And uh, that, that certainly puts the pressure on everybody else in the ecosystem to compete effectively. Um, and uh, almost across Across the board, it is uh, it's a cost of doing business to spend money on marketing. And um, what we have here are some data, again, that we collected from retailers through the State of Retailing on Online survey. Um, that was uh, that was sponsored by Shop.org is uh, is essentially the average um, percents um, that various line items within an e-commerce P&L comprise as a percent of the revenue of that e-commerce site. Um, so not surprisingly, your COGS is going to be the highest. And uh, theoretically, um, you know, when your COGS are in the 40% range, that should mean that your contribution margin is pretty strong. But um, you have a whole bunch of other expenses that are essential to an e-commerce business operating, like fulfillment expenses, and uh, your, of course, your your um, your executive team, but um, 
the uh, the second biggest expense um, that actually comprises um, the uh, the costs for any business um, behind fulfillment is actually the marketing expenditure because it is so competitive and it's so hard to stand out as an e-commerce retailer. Um, now that said, um, there are things that of course companies can do to differentiate themselves um, once they actually get a consumer to spend time on their website, and uh, that's where web merchandising can actually be a substantial way to at least improve the customer experience. And um, again, this is the data from, from retailers through the State of Retailing Online survey, um, where we essentially asked retailers um, to tell us what are they finding effective and how often are they, how likely are they to actually um, incorporate a certain feature. And uh, we sort of mapped it into four quadrants. And uh, everything that was more effective was regarded by retailers as driving some value for the organization, whether it was sales or margin um, or some type of a metric that actually moved the needle on the business performance. And usage was how common was this particular tactic. And I think this is really important because often a lot of benchmarking tools will only just look at usage. And there is um, sometimes a misguided belief that just because everybody else in the industry is doing something that it is valuable and it must drive some value. But the truth is that there are a lot of experiments that happen in e-commerce. There are um, a ton of experiments that happen because there are, hypo are hypotheses around what can move the needle. But in fact, there are a lot of those tactics tactics that, um, that, that fizzle because they just aren't that effective. Like, for instance, um, there are things that um, generally are regarded as, um, as, as, as generally broadly used but less effective, like virtual catalogs, for instance. That's something that we've heard um, issues about for, for years. Um, but other things like, um, you, you know, kind of the imagery, um, top seller, Zoom, outlet functionality, those are all incredibly important. And, uh, and what we do is we sort of break it out. And I won't go through everything on this list, but um, you'll have access to these slides after the fact. But everything in the upper right-hand quadrant are things that we consider um, basically table stakes in a business. They are must-haves that um, your competitors have, and uh, they also drive value. So these are things that are important. Um, on the upper left-hand quadrant, these are things that you should have because the companies that have integrated them do find them effective, um, even though they're not as broadly implemented, things like A-B testing or even product recommendations. Um, and then you have things that are in uh, the bottom right-hand quadrant um, that are less effective, but other companies um, you know, tend to have them. And these are things that, if you've already tackled everything else on your roadmap, um, these are things that could be worth considering, but certainly not essential. And uh, everything in the lower um, right-hand the lower left-hand quadrant, we will say, um, you know, kind of are things that are nice but not really necessary because uh, consumers just haven't really found them that effective and uh, they're, they're not even really that broadly used, things like gift registries or wish lists. Now, there are always exceptions, um, not, uh, you know, there are certain businesses that are in the wedding space, um, for instance, that are going to find gift registries incredibly important. And um, if you're in the wedding space, you can ignore or that advice, but if you're not in the wedding space and you are considering a gift registry, um, you want to think very carefully about it because uh, because there are companies that have integrated um, tools and features like that that haven't found them terribly effective. Now, other than merchandising and marketing, I think it's incredibly important um, to also consider uh, one other aspect of the business overall, and that is the merchandise itself, your selection and the assortment that you have um, that ultimately drives the shopper to you. And perhaps more than anything, this is one of the key differentiating factors of online retail um, over the other channels where a consumer can complete a transaction. And what we have here is data from Forrester's um, Technographics data. This is our online consumer research that we do on a pretty frequent basis through the course of any given year. And one of the questions that we ask is, why do you shop online and what drives you to shop online? And how much do you agree with these statements? And um, almost 
consistently um, over the years that we've done this, the number one reasons that consumers purchase online, um, and uh, it's it you know kind of may vary in whether it's number one, number two, or number three, depending on the time of year that you do the survey and which particular customers that you ask. Um, but at the top of the list here, we see things um, that are related to selection that that you know kind of more consumers say that they shop online. Um, to find products that they can't find anywhere else over almost any of the other reasons. But as you can see, these numbers are all pretty high, and they're fairly um, they're fairly compressed in, in their spread um, because if it's not selection, it's convenience. And if it's not convenience, then it's something like value, which are, which are really about great prices and being able to often avoid um, having to pay sales tax. Um, but at the same time, even though selection is one of the reasons that consumers will go to the web to find those items, the sizes that may be difficult to find or colors that they may not find in their local store, some other um, aspect of a product that isn't broadly available, it's also incredibly important um, to reduce a shopper's stress during the course of that transaction and the course of that search process. And the reason that, uh, that that's important is, um, is a framework that we had pulled together um, in a report that we put out at Forrester called How People Choose. And basically what we mapped is um, how urgent is, is it that a consumer completes a particular transaction um, and, uh, you know, kind of how much time do they have? Do they need to make it right now? Um, for instance, uh, you know, kind of do you need to fill your tank with gasoline because you're running out of gas? How urgent is it? Um, and, uh, and how important is it? And, uh, you know, is it a really high-stakes decision um, where you are going to be spending a lot of money or there is a really big big risk of making a mistake, or is it a relatively low stakes decision, like, um, you know, deciding which, um, which uh, brand of yogurt to, to purchase. Um, so based on, on, you know, kind of those two parameters, we sort of broke up, you know, kind of almost all of your shopping decisions into one of four buckets. They're, um, you know, urgent in which, you know, you have little time and it's a high stakes um, investment, um, a routine decision in which you, um, you know, kind of may have, uh, you know, you have, you know, kind of not too much time, but, you know, kind of it's a low stakes decision, an important decision in which it is higher stakes, um, um, but uh, but you may not have time, and then leisure in which it's both high stakes and you do um, be, you know kind of have a lot of time. So it's it's those different characteristics that we're thinking about. And what I would urge you to do is you know kind of for your different products, for your different customers, and their different need states, um, where do these decision types fall? And sometimes you know you may have a consumer making an urgent decision with you, but on another day they may be making a leisure decision. You know kind of. If you're an airline travel site, um, it could be that they that a consumer needs to get somewhere tomorrow, um, and they need to make a decision right away. Or in some cases, they may be planning a vacation. And in any case, um, you, you know, kind of there are a lot of uh, challenges that a consumer has, which is the middle section, um, and it can range from uncertainty to um, you know, kind of trying to differentiate amongst all of the different choices that are out there, but. But then how consumers ultimately make those decisions based on what the decision type is, is, uh, is often based on certain types of, uh, of cues. And it can be anything from what is going to mitigate my risk in the greatest way, um, what brands do I know already that I can count on that aren't going to disappoint me, which is why you know the yogurt example often has somebody kind of defaulting to the brands that they know. Um, and where do things like recommendations or new developments or guidance, where are those particularly um, of use? And those tend to be more in uh, the decisions where there's more time and where a consumer um, is going to invest a little bit more in the research process because they want to be sure to not make um, a mistake. So what we have is, uh, is a world in which you know, there's more selection and there's more that's available to customers. They have tons of stores. Um, and also, um, we we have an environment where all of that choice often does create stress and it creates uncertainty and there are opportunities to reduce that stress and uncertainty by guiding shoppers a bit more with what are the um, 
the better products that they may want to purchase or what are the ones that um, may be proven in some way that, um, that, that uh, you know, kind of help support um, your relationship with your customers. So it's, it's more than just kind of offering every single SKU of a particular item, but also guiding them toward better items that can actually solve um, very pertinent needs that they may have. Um, what we also have is a world in which um, there are more manufacturers essentially going direct to consumer. And the reason for that has a lot to do with the price transparency that's available online. And uh, as you get more tri price transparency available online and as you um, get uh, more manufacturers comfortable with the notion of selling direct to consumer and you get um, more um, familiar customers, more consumers who are um, used to and are adapting to purchasing virtually every product from not just consumer electronics but appliances and furniture online, um, you have uh, the world of brands bifurcating into two big buckets. And on the right-hand extreme, you have highly protected brands who essentially dictate the terms that um, their customers, their retail distributors, um, have with them. And, um, and we know what, who all these brands are. They're, um, they're really the powerhouses of the branding world, and uh, they are companies that have their own stores and are very formidable in their presence, in their store presences. Companies like Apple, Nike, um, Nespresso, and Louis Vuitton are uh, four of the examples that I would point out here. And then on the other extreme, you have highly commodity brands. These are brands that, um, that consumers uh, may be comfortable with and may default to because they've heard them somewhere and they know that it's a solid product, but these are not brands that consumers seek out um, to do business with. These are brands that, um, that essentially um, you know, get the job done, and uh, these are also brands that are highly prone to uh, being knocked off in a private label format because, um, because the consumer doesn't always seek out um, the brand. The consumer just seeks out the solution that 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 uh, that product serves. And um, if there is a comparable um, product that is priced um, sometimes even lower than these brands, that becomes a very attractive alternative. And sometimes there are companies in the middle that may not have exactly a store presence, but they do try to protect themselves a little bit. Um, you know, but uh, they're 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 not exactly adherent to to either. But they're they're sort of caught in no man's land. But but this idea of protected versus commoditized brands is an incredibly important one because what it's ultimately going to do is it's going to shape how um, we buy the products that we buy, and it even is going to shape the, the, the different types of, uh, of products that are available to us. And, um, and it will have an impact on uh, the economics and the profitability of, uh, of retailers. And what that ultimately does is that that gives opportunity for other um, newly undiscovered products to, to come to the forefront. So really, um, you know, the title of the slide here should say four types of products, so forgive me for, uh, for, that, uh, for that oversight. Um, but, uh, but really what this is is that we'll see a world in which really um, there are going to be four types of products in physical stores as a result of this uh, this evolution and um, most stores particularly for multi brand stores will likely introduce if they don't already have private label products in their physical stores and uh, those are their own branded products that um, that are essentially made by and distributed um, at a particular merchant and uh, typically merchants will see this as a profit center for their own businesses um, and what it means uh, for our brands is that if you you are a brand, you want to protect your IP as much as possible and try to push yourself to be as, as, as protected as possible because if you are a commoditized brand and you still get distribu distribution through your typical, through only retail channels, um, you're highly likely to be um, knocked off in some way and uh, that's, a, that's a situation that um, could be untenable for you in the long term as, 
as um, the, you know, kind of more and more of that shelf space may be given to a private label brand. Um, the second type of product are those st standalone brands. Those are the protected brands that we talked about on the previous page. And um, because they command so much market presence and because they dictate the terms that um, retailers can work with them, they, uh, they can – um, they have the the leverage to be able to give some some you know kind of of their their um, um, their margins back to uh, back to retailers, and that drives some modest profit and often traffic. Um, but uh, but ultimately, these are brands that um, will continue to and already do invest very heavily in uh, in their own brand presence. And uh, and if you do that, you know the best place where you can really communicate the power of your brand is in your owned and branded stores. And and that's something that that you see, and that's part of the reason that you do see a brand like Apple um, really really investing heavily in its physical store presence. Um, and the third type of product are those commodities or substitutable brands. And um, those are the brands that typically make up the lion's share of the shelf space in most physical goods stores. And uh, in the long term, we believe these are going to be break-even products at best and often loss leaders because um, because they are so heavily commoditized and because they're so broadly available, it's just going to be a bit of, uh, of a race to the bottom as retailers look to try to compete on price and, uh, and offer these commoditized products for whatever price they need to offer them in order to, uh, to be competitive with channels like the Internet. And, uh, and the challenge is that these businesses are likely um, going to continue to be squeezed from a margin standpoint. And whereas in the past they may have been protected by um, the fact that the Internet didn't exist or by the fact that uh, consumers didn't, um, weren't easily able to shop around for a product, um, that, uh, that that's changed now. And uh, these companies, unless they do have a very specific and formidable um, intellectual property advantage, they are likely to uh, to simply um, be be squeezed. And then the fourth most important and interesting area that we see a change in retail, and I think that um, this flows into some of the uh, the opportunities that Ogham has, which is uh, it's about unique long tail items making their way not just into physical stores, but also into online channels. And uh, we really believe that these have also huge opportunities to deliver profit centers for retail stores. And uh, it's not easy to do because, uh, you know, kind of long tail items can can quickly, um, you know, kind of disappear or they're hard to find or um, they themselves can be challenged. Um, but, uh, but the truth is, is that um, these are these are products that have an opportunity to um, serve niche audiences. Um, they're an opportunity to create um, a bit of an innovation lab um, type experience for your own private label goods. Um, but these are ways to find diamonds in the rough that could um, essentially help to fuel your product pipeline because. I think in all of our conversations that we have in retail about how do you compete, how do you deliver a better customer experience, the main reason that consumers shop at most stores is because of ultimately the merchandise that is sold at those stores. And, um, and you want to uh, take advantage of that. And this applies, um, this fourth category applies not just to, uh, to retailers, but to brands as well. Um, so I think that these are things that are incredibly important um, to keep in mind. So at this point, I'm going to transition to Sadir, and uh, there are a few poll questions that I think that he has to, to make that transition. Yeah, this is Debbie. I'm going to jump in with the first poll question. Um, so this is the time we'd like to get our attendees involved in the conversation. Um, and here's the question, and, and I'll read the answers, and please, um, you know, Submit your, your answer as soon as you uh, have one. So what do you think is the most effective lever in increasing conversion? Um, is it better marketing promotions, better user experience, lower prices, better Google ranking, um, or more reviews? Um, so take a minute, think about those. I, I know it could be tough to decide between one or the other at, uh, at first, but think about which is the most effective lever in increasing conversion. Share your answer with us, and then we'll take a look at the results.
All right, just a few more seconds and uh, we're going to look at the results. So here we have a, a pretty good mix of responses. And um, Sudhir, I thought maybe you'd like to jump in and kind of um, give us your insights on, on the results of this question. Uh, sure. I, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, the results by, uh, you know, speak for themselves. Um, at least mm -hmm. the better user experience again, right? I mean, uh, uh, it talks to the point that Sucharita made earlier uh, about, uh, about a more engaging uh, experience and that being the differentiator. I think to a large extent, price is becoming very transparent across. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about this as I, as I get into the rest of the presentation as well. Uh, and we, and we'll, we'll visit each one of these and, and the impact it has uh, on, on not just uh, conversion, but also traffic. Now, uh, so, uh, so a shout out to Suchirata there for that uh, engaging presentation and insights into different product types and the associated trends. Uh, uh, and the, the, the observation that uh, you know, the lines somewhat seem to be blurring between retailers uh, and brands. Uh, and it would, be, it would be kind of interesting to see the business models that emerge as a result, right? So you have the brands going directly to the consumers. You have the retailers getting into private labels. So this, it makes for an interesting ecosystem there. Uh, now, my section of the presentation is going to be focused on how product intelligence can be leveraged to drive category performance. Uh, now, product intelligence here I'm defining as a set of capabilities uh, and technologies to collect and aggregate data around the category. Uh, and products within that category to identify trends and to be able to take actionable insights around merchandising decisions. Now, uh, so I'm going to start with a, with a bit of a teaser there. So what do you think is common across these three products? Uh, the first one is a product called Pupuri. Uh, it kind of falls into the, uh, uh, and if you remember the product types that Sucharita talked about, it, talk, it, it kind of falls into the long tail interesting item category. Uh, it has an interesting use case. Uh, it gets classified under air fresheners, but it's, uh, I don't think it's quite that. Uh, the second one uh, used to fall under the unique long tail item category. It's a, it's a Bluetooth headset manufactured by LG, uh, but it's, it's getting to be a, a significantly identified brand, and especially in that category. Uh, the third one uh, should be pretty familiar, uh, especially to the juicers and the health freaks out there. So it's, it's the Vitamix Blender 750. Uh, this kind of falls into the standalone brand uh, category that Suchirata talked about. So the question is, you know, what do you think? What do you think is common across all of these products? Now let's take it the let's take a look at the first one. Uh, this is this is the Pupuri, right? Uh, so this product does get classified under air freshness, uh, but that doesn't quite begin to describe what the product is all about. Uh, now for for figuring out what the product is all about, you need to look at the interesting YouTube videos uh, that they have out there for this particular product. It's based in my hometown, Dallas. And I started to create quite the buzz. Uh, now, to the point that Sucharita made earlier, now whether this buzz lasts or is this a temporary fad uh, kind of remains to be seen. However, if you look at the reviews, uh, now uh, this is the review count of that particular product across retailers that carry that product over a period of time. Now, as you can see, the product did reasonably well in 2012 and in 2013-14, the product really took off. And it shows a similar trend when you look at the, uh, the number of consumer searches on this particular product. Now the question here is, you know, how do you think the product is going to do well in the holiday season? Will it make for a good gift? Now last year, if you look at the, the consumer search trend associated with this product in the October-November time frame, the product did spike significantly at interest levels in the holiday season. Uh, so, uh, so it did make for a, uh, for a good gift. A lot of people bought into this product. Uh, will it do so again this year? Now, if you look at the search trends again and you look at the reviews and the rate of growth of reviews, uh, it's at least our prediction that the product will do well. Uh, so you will see a spike in the holiday period, but with a reduced amplitude. Let's take a different example. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the, these two Bluetooth headsets. Now, the one on the left is, uh, is the LG Bluetooth headset that I, uh, that I talked about. Uh, it's, it's priced at $69.99. The second one is by Plantronics. Uh, it's, a, it's called the Plantronics M50 product, uh, priced at $29.99. Now, if a, if a retailer were to go purely by NPD Nielsen data um, and, and ask us to, you know, which of these two products will do well in the holiday season, uh, most of them would probably bet um, or would, would have bet uh, on, the, on the M50 product. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recognized brand name. Uh, Plantronics is known for, uh, for their Bluetooth headset. It's a very popular product. Um, so, uh, but let's look at what the, what the consumer 
uh, demand signal say. Now the first chart here is that of reviews. This is the rate of growth. This is the reviews of each of those products over a period of time. Now look at the slope there. Um, the in the in the 2012 time frame, uh, you know the the, the Plantronics M50 was definitely popular. Uh, but if you look at between 2013, 14, and you look at the trend there, uh, the you know the winner by by a long margin is, is LG. Uh, look at the second chart, which is the search volume associated with this product uh, uh, from from Google. And again, the, the the winner by a huge margin is LG. Right. So. So looking at the products and the reviews, uh, and you know, we've just looked at two of the demand signals here, reviews and search. There are other demand signals that can be collected uh, um, with, with, with each product. It kind of tells us which product is going to do well, uh, but, but do they really tell us why? Um, I, have a, I have a confession to make, right? I, 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 I hear voices, uh, and, and voices directly from the consumer. Uh, and I, it sounds creepy, I know, uh, but it's true. Uh, I, I don't see dead people yet. Uh, but I do hear voices. Uh, I do see some dead retailers and some uh, and some zombie retailers. Um, uh, but I'm going to move on from the from the Liam Halloween jokes. Uh, the point here to make is these voices tell me things. Right. So if you look at the Bluetooth headsets as an example, uh, and you look at uh, the product, every product is made up of attributes. Attributes could be brand, style, features. Now, when you break a product down to its attributes, it tells us a story. The fact is that with smartphones, stereo as an attribute has really taken off, which is the, which is the fourth um, uh, attribute here. Uh, logical when you think about it, right? Smartphones, I used to listen it to music, but now uh, you know, I can and also make phone calls. So it's, it's, it's logical with the trend towards smartphones. Behind the, uh, behind the head as a style has gone up too, uh, right? Over the year has gone down. It's more comfortable to wear, activity friendly. I can wear it while running. Noise cancellation, not doing so well. Uh, Multipoint seems to have taken off in 2015 because people have multiple devices that they own now. Now, how would these data points influence an assortment decision on, on part from budget? Uh, how would it influence the associated marketing messages? Which keywords would you emphasize in marketing? Which products would you put on clearance? Now, to me at least, uh, you know, looking at the Bluetooth headset category as a data, it's very clear. I, I think a lot of the single earpiece ones need to be put on clearance. You, you're exhausting inventory. The trend is towards multi-point uh, stereo headsets, more comfortable to wear. Uh, so a larger part of the assortment space, whether it's in the, uh, you know, whether in terms of marketing messages or in terms of the, the space allocated it to, into a store needs to go towards the, the, the stereo Bluetooth headsets. Uh, the, the point is that I'm not the only creepy person around here, right? All of us can hear these voices. Uh, the, the, the data on these voices has, has kind of exploded. And uh, but the good, good thing is these voices to a large extent are free, right? Uh, you know, consumers are, are telling us what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what they don't want. Uh, what is needed is the ability to listen uh, and interpret. Uh, what is needed is the, is the medium, the, 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 the go-between, the, the fortune teller, if you will. Now, for me, this is what product intelligence is all about. Uh, it's, it's the go-between. It's the set of capability and technology uh, that enables you to listen to what consumers are telling you. Analyzing them for insights and applying them to improve merchandise performance. That's what product intelligence is all about. It's a combination of data, technology, and analytics that help us analyze consumer preference and behavior on product and, and category preferences and, and, and trends. Now, uh, how do I apply this uh, to retail? Now, when you, when you fundamentally look at retail, retail is about leveraging assets. Right? So it's a, you know, I could have a brick and mortar asset, uh, which is, uh, uh, or I could have a web store. Right? So these are properties I own, and these properties exist for a reason. They, they, they exist to get you traffic, and it's your goal to try and convert a portion of that traffic uh, and make them a, uh, make them a buyer. Uh, the, the goal is, 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 is the same, whether it's a, it's a web property or a, or a store property, to get you traffic and get you conversion. Now, when you look at the several factors that, that impact uh, uh, traffic and conversion, the one that comes most to mind is price and promotion. And I'm glad to see in the survey that that's not the most, uh, uh, most identified item now. Uh, but it is the, easel, it's the easiest to apply, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, to do a price reduction is easy. But it's expensive to maintain because it has an impact on the overall margin dollars. And what you've seen is this is what tends to happen. So the graph shows a particular product uh, they start out at different price points, uh, but because there is 
uh, uh, there is transparency in the price, it leads to convergence. So for a vast majority of the commodity products that, that Sucharita talked about earlier in her presentation, price transparency leads to convergence. Now for the standalone brands, price is dictated by the brand, so it becomes less of an influence. Right? So let's look at what are the other factors that are out there which can help us uh, influence uh, traffic and conversions. Uh, now the, 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 the orange boxes indicate those factors uh, and the figures there indicate the extent of correlation between those parameters and the two KPIs that we are talking about, traffic and conversion. Right? So the higher the correlation, the more is the impact on traffic and conversion. Now if you look at uh, traffic on the left hand side, it's still a function of referrals and backlinks. Uh, and in case of a brick and mortar store, it's, a, it's a significantly a function of location as well. Um, and it's about pleasing the Google God with search engine optimization. Right? Um, the more engaging the content of the message which comes to the product page content there, uh, the more engaging the store experience, higher the traffic. Higher the referrals, higher the traffic. Now let's look at conversion. Now while price and promotion still have the highest impact on conversion, next comes reviews. And some of you have pointed that out in, uh, in, the, in the poll results. Right? Um, Reviews have a log-log relationship, however. Uh, you know, in non-geek language, what that means is the impact of the first few reviews is significantly higher than the subsequent reviews. In addition to reviews, engaging content on the product page or in the store also matters. Let's look at one more example. This is the 750, Watermix 750 blender that, I'm, that I talked about earlier. It's, it's, it's doing really well. Uh, demand signals are excellent on this product. Now, now, if I look at the two retailers who carry this product, so, the, so retailer number one is carrying the product on the left-hand side, retailer number two, the same product, uh, but different retailer, right? Uh, at the same price, uh, because as Suchirita pointed out, this is Vitamix, uh, they, um, um, they are a well-known brand and they do have the ability to control the prices and the brand experience uh, to some extent. Now, which one of these do you think will sell more? Uh, the retailer on the left had good reviews, had a great image, uh, ranked high on Google, uh, they were I think uh, uh, the number three on the first page of Google, and the blender was one of the top most selling items. Retailer number two on the right hand side had it at the same price, well known retailer again, had no reviews however, had used the manufacturer supplied image, and was ranked on page three on Google results. Uh, and uh, you know the item didn't even make it to the, the, the top 30 percentile in terms of the sales volume. Now if I make this uh, a few tweaks. Right? I'm still not touching price, however. I, I, I made the image more colorful. Uh, I've increased the reviews based on a focused effort to obtain reviews for this product. Now, I'm not doing a review campaign to increase reviews for all products. I'm, I'm focusing on the products where I'm going to see a significant ROI. Um, no change in price, better uh, content. Uh, we saw a significant increase in sales with no compromise on margin dollars. All because we took a product that was already doing well in the market, right? So this product had the wind behind its back, you know, the significant demand there. And as opposed to dropping price, address the areas that needed attention. In this case, the attention was, was on consumer engagement. Uh, the same exercise can be done at scale as well. Uh, this graph shows the conversion for a particular category over time. The, the blue line is the actual conversion. The black line is the moving average of conversion over time. Now, as you can see in this particular retailer, the, the conversion was dropping. Uh, now, sometime in the August time frame, uh, there were content interventions that were applied. No change in price, without changing any price. So there were some targeted content interventions in the August time frame, and you can see the results. The, the conversion increased significantly, and all the increase in conversion adds to the bottom line since there's no changes to the price. Um, now, let's look at a different example this time. Uh, Fisherman Sanders, uh, a, a very exotic category. Uh, the product on the left is the, is the Keen Newport H2, uh, which is a very popular uh, sandal, uh, great uh, um, uh, reviews from hikers, uh, 2,000 reviews, will continue to do well. The second one on the, on the right hand side is the Pacific Chasky sandal, good reviews, it kind of is similar to you know, a, a lesser known uh, product, um, price significantly lower than Keen, but if you look at the, the cross-sell traffic there, uh, the, the, the indicator there, on the first one, the cross-sell traffic is 30%. On the Pacific Trail Chasky, the cross-sell traffic is 60%. Now, what I mean by cross-sell traffic is the traffic that comes to these product through recommendations or to other product pages or through buying guides. It essentially means that customers come to the site 
uh, looking for the keen Newport H2, which is the first product, but they get guided towards the Pacific Trail Chafki. So they have to find it. They, you know, they're looking for the, the, the particular sand. Now, which one of these products does the retailer need to be more price sensitive about? Uh, price elasticity historically has been calculated based on historical sales and historical prices. Relationship between the two gives us price elasticity. Showrooming has changed the relevancy significantly for the majority of the categories. Sales may drop, not because my price is increased, but also because a competitor dropped their price. The, the other thing to remember is price elasticity changes by time. Uh, it changes. It changes. It, it's a different elasticity during holiday period than it's during the normal period. Now, in this example, the cross-sell traffic on the product gives me a more real-time indication of the elasticity uh, than traditional measures. Let's look at what the data uh, has to say about that. Uh, here's a data table that illustrates what we just talked about. The x-axis is the price competitiveness. As you move from left to right, the, uh, the price competitiveness improves. You become more and more competitive with respect to your price. The y-axis is loyalty, uh, which is essentially a measure of what percentage of the traffic comes from cross-sell as opposed to a consumer looking for the best price. So as you go down, the loyalty uh, or the loyalty quotient of that particular product increases. And the values in the table there are, uh, are the conversion uh, as a multiple of the lowest conversion factor out there. Now, as you can see, the conversion on a property increases with price competitiveness, right? Not, not rocket science. Uh, you know, you reduce your price, you improve your price competitiveness in the market, your conversion improves. Your conversion also increases with loyalty. You know, no rocket science there either, right? So you have more loyal customers, your price competitiveness or uh, your, uh, your conversion has to, has to improve. What's interesting, though, is the scale of increase. Now, if you look at the low loyalty traffic there, the conversion has increased from X to 6.X, 6X. 6X increase in conversion. If you look at the high loyalty there, the loyalty has increased from 10.4X to 16.4X. So the price sensitivity of products which fall into the low loyalty traffic is very different from that of high loyalty traffic. Now the function is, in a sense, we, what we're saying is the price sensitivity is, is lower in traffic that is more loyal. Now, I can apply this and apply this data to, to make more intelligent pricing decisions as opposed to you know, matching a, a competitor's price. And the next slide kind of illustrates that. Um, we strongly believe that competitor prices uh, provide data points uh, but cannot and should not be used as the only variable to trigger a price action. Uh, you know, look at, look at the, the conversion here. The graph indicates conversion uh, and it's got an upper limit and a lower limit. Uh, now, what we, are, what we are recommending is that you look at conversion with respect to that upper limit and lower limit. So whenever conversion drops below a certain threshold, it's an indication of something happening in the market. It could be because a, a, a competitor has reduced their price, therefore your conversion has dropped. It could be that a newer model has been introduced. Or it could be bad news related to the brand in terms of you know, some recalls. Uh, now, the trigger for the price change is the conversion dropping below that predefined threshold. Uh, and then you make a price change uh, to get you back into that margin maximization range. And similarly, when conversion goes above a certain threshold, that's an indication that the demand has far exceeded the supply. It's going, uh, the product is doing well for a certain reason. It could be a trigger for an increase in price. The idea here is, is, is to use price as a lever to skim margins and avoid drops in margin where, where it is not required. Um, now, if I put all of this together, uh, this is how product intelligence can be leveraged to help improve merchandise performance. Uh, it can help identify targeted interventions across assortment, content, and price that help improve the efficiency of the conversion product. So the first question that we are trying to answer is, is there enough demand for the product? Right? So you, you, you looked at the Pupuri example or the LG Bluetooth headset example. And you, you first assess as to you know, whether there are enough demand, signal, demand signals associated with that product or that category of products. Now, if there is, to what extent am I getting a share of that demand? Um, is the demand coming my way or is it going to my competitors? How do I get a share of that particular demand? Now, the first two questions help us identify merchandising assortment interventions, address assortment gaps, or undertaking, uh, undertake marketing and SEO interventions to help improve traffic. Now, if there indeed is traffic, uh, let's say, you know, as a retailer, you're doing well, you're getting a significant portion of the traffic, but, you, but your conversion uh, is low. It essentially points to two levers, right? So one is price uh, is, is, is one of the levers. The second is the content, which uh, kind of is a placeholder there for the entire store experience and the page uh, and, the, and the product page there. Uh, price has a higher lever towards uh, driving conversion, but it's more expensive. It, it, it reduces the margin. 
content provides a higher margin in it. Now using both in conjunction and understanding the trade-offs between the two uh, helps maximize margin dollars. Now uh, at Ugam we work with nine of the top 25 retailers so we have data, we have, we have lots of data, huge volumes of data. So we did a statistical analysis to see if we can use these uh, you know footprints that I talked about right so, so reviews, searches, backlinks uh, and other demand signals to predict the relative ranking of a product. Uh, so we, get, we got an accuracy of around 60% right and our ability to predict ranking to a plus or minus 20. Our ability to predict the top 100 in a category was around 80% and this is not, not, not bad right for, for free information. Our challenge at Tugum is to improve this further. Our goal is to kind of build the LinkedIn of product and become the, the, the so-called fortune teller of the, of the medium the product intelligence space. Um, anyway, give us a category and we'll tell you, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the products and the categories and the, and, the, and the attributes that are trending. Uh, these are the results that we have seen at a category level uh, from these various interventions. Um, you know, 7.5% increase in sales, 21 basis points improvement in conversion, 3.75% increase in margin dollars, and so on and so forth. So these interventions are applied at different times in the cycle though. Uh, assortment is during the uh, you know, buying season, um, content post buying and sometimes in season and the price is in season. Uh, so that's all I had, uh, thanks for being a patient audience. I'm going to hand it back uh, to Debbie for another poll question. Uh, and uh, this is despite me telling the marketing department that I can hear voices and therefore need no polls. Um, Debbie, back to you. Thanks, Sudhir. Thank you. A lot of great information and a lot for all of us to think about, both from you and um, from Sucharita. So uh, uh, I want to quickly go through our next poll question, then we'll have time um, for Q&A for just a few minutes before we wrap up. So um, getting our attendees back involved, um, the question is, where do you currently get your product intelligence from? Um, do you get it from your merchant's gut feeling? From suppliers, do you get it from third-party market research agencies such as NPD, Nielsen? Um, do you get your product intelligence from customers uh, or from last year's sales numbers? So where do you primarily get your product intelligence from? Um, please answer that question. We'll look at the results and then we'll have time for uh, Q&A for a few minutes before we wrap up. All right, in the interest of time, I'm just going to give it a few more seconds. We'll take a quick look. And we see that uh, customers and last year's sales numbers are their primary resources. Um, so Sudhir or Suturita, do you have any thoughts on, on this question that you want to share? Uh, sure. I would add that I think um, a lot of these elements of product intelligence are uh, are evolving and growing, and uh, that's one of the, the components that's really different now is that we can use data to gather much more product intelligence than I think retailers had had before. Um, and uh, historically, it uh, was, of course, based on sales numbers because that's really um, as much as you could capture. But things are changing so quickly, and merchandising um, hasn't necessarily um, changed as fast to adapt to, to those uh, differences. All right, terrific. Um, so, Sudhir, um, I have a question for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the fact that, you, so you mentioned that product intelligence helps identify trends and therefore helps merchants create a better assortment. But can you talk a little bit more specifically about the types of trends that product intelligence helps identify and how do you separate out the short-term trends versus long-term trends? Uh, that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So now uh, when, when you look at the demand signals out there, right? Um, uh, the idea is that the, the, the uh, so you have your world's biggest consumer base there, which is people who are basically searching, right, or, or posting. So the so the extent of social data or search volume or search data has increased. Now the in being able to identify a trend, it is important to be able to marry those search terms or reviews with a product and the associated attributes. And you need to be able to do it at scale. It's not just about mapping for the first top three products or the top 10 products. It's about mapping for all the products out there which exist in a category, and then mapping it at scale across these set of products and see, okay, what, what the trend is there. Um, and when you look at, the, the, look at the, the numbers there, so for example, uh, I, you know, the Pupuri example that I talked about, 
uh, I said, uh, I made a prediction saying that, look, I mean, it's going to do well this holiday period. I see a decreasing amplitude, right? So I, uh, I definitely see that as a, as a bit of a fad, right? Now, whether that converts into anything long term, I have my doubts. Um, and the, it's kind of similar to the Angry Birds thing there. And you can see that in the data, right? So, so when you look at the number of people searching for it last year versus this year, and you look at the rate of increase of reviews or the rate of increase of search, uh, searches on that, on that particular product, you can see that while there is an interest, and from, uh, uh, you know, from, an, from an earlier period to this period, the, rate, the interest is increasing, but the rate of increase is, is lower. And you can make interpretations, therefore, uh, of, of, the, of the direction of the trend and the, and the amplitude or the magnitude of the trend. All right, terrific. Um, so I think that we have time for maybe one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, Sucharia, you were talking about marketing expenses and that they are generally high right now. Um, where do you see that going? Do you see that changing much? Do you think that um, you know people are companies are going to be focusing on marketing more or less in the future? Um, I don't see any situation where companies won't focus on marketing into the future because it is so important in a competitive landscape. And, um, you, you know, there are so many examples of companies that may come out of the gate really quickly because social networks amplify um, their launch, but then within 12 months, um, their, you know, that, that, uh, that energy is completely gone. So, um, you, you know, if you're there to just be a flash in the pan, I suppose you don't need marketing. But if you're trying to build a long-term sustainable plan and a brand, there's no way that you can get away from marketing. And uh, the number of marketing channels that exist are really limited. Um, you know, I mean, I would argue that, um, you know, it's almost oligopolistic in nature. Um, you know, kind of what are the channels that you even have available to you to get, um, you know, kind of mind share um, on, on the Internet. So, um, you, you know, kind of that so and and those those prices are not going down when you look at paid search or um, or or even you know kind of Facebook ads those or display any type of display ads um, you know companies are getting better at making them more effective but those prices aren't going down and then you're left with well what are my other channels and that's where things like direct mail come back into the equation um, or catalogs and uh, those are definitely not cheap either so um, the, this is just one of the you know the cost of doing business as you uh, as you as you try to um, make your way amidst uh, the the competition that exists in the retail world. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again, both both of you, for your insights. And um, we're we're running out of time. I know we didn't get to answer everyone's questions, but we have them available to our speakers who can uh, reach out to you afterwards. Um, so again, I want to thank Sucharita and Sudhir, and our, I want to thank all of our attendees for participating, listening, and, and participating in our poll questions. Um, our next session in the Strategy and Planning Series is tomorrow at 12 noon, and it's called Mobile in the Workplace, What Are You So Afraid Of? So it should be, should be a great conversation tomorrow. Please join us at 12 noon. Um, we have a few more sessions in the series uh, leading up to Friday. And um, again, if you don't get a chance to attend them live, they're available on demand. So uh, again, thanks everybody for attending, and we're going to wrap up and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.